Welcome to Love Life, featuring your hosts, Rebecca Detman and Jane Donovan. The sun shines bright as it moves across my face. I feel the light. I embrace my sensitivity as the amazing gift it is. Welcome to Love Life. I'm Rebecca Detman. And I'm Jane Donovan. And have we got a corker for you? <laughs> Back by popular demand, <laughs> HSP Part 2. That has been, I think, the most clicked upon podcast of the 78 that we've done so far, 78 shows we've done so far. For some reason, people all over the world keep finding us, usually through iTunes, on the episode we did on what it means to be highly sensitive in this day and age. Look, the reason that this has had such a big reaction is because this, in terms of medical research, is very new. I mean, we're talking in the 90s that this amazing woman, uh, Dr. Elaine Aaron, did her PhD on what she thought could be a trait known as sensitivity. Right. And so it is really new research. And the problem with being highly sensitive, we'll get into all that in a minute, but the problem with spreading the word on this is that the people that are highly sensitive, which is 18 to 20% of the population, of those, 97%, 97% are introverted. So only 3% are extroverted. So what does that mean? It means that the people that have this wisdom and this knowledge lack the ability to be able to spread the word. To share it, yeah. And so when I actually spoke to um, Dr. Aaron, she was really excited to hear that I was extroverted and high, or what is known as high sensation seeking. And she has given me full permission to use her work here, there and everywhere to spread the word because there's not many of us that are highly sensitive and extroverted that are confident enough to actually go and spread the word because by putting yourself out there, you're making yourself vulnerable for your sensitivity to be attacked. Right. <laughs> so it actually is. The, 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 so the problem is people don't know about this research as a result. Yeah. So, I mean, I have spoken to dozens, if not hundreds, of medical doctors that have not known about this, you know, teachers that have never heard of it. And, you know, when you fill out a form about your children, what do we need to know? You need to know my child's highly sensitive. Oh, I love it, Jane. You know? Oh. And so I've probably spoken to thousands and thousands of people that have never heard of it, that are all in important roles where this is really useful wisdom for them to help manage people. That's right. So we need to spread the word. So that's why people have had such a reaction to this because they're saying exactly the same as I did when I first stumbled across Dr. Aaron's book is that, oh, my God, I thought it was just me. And there's no, nothing more exciting than realizing, first off, that you're not alone, that you've got not just a tribe, but a massive tribe. And secondly, that it's not a problem. It's a gift. It is. And we want today to really go deeper into the gifts, into survival techniques and tips if you are HSP or HSS, or if you're married to one or your friends and family are or how to parent those kind of children, we're going to look at it in terms of the whole community. We're going to, I want to look at the body a bit because HSPs are often have suffered from a lot of physical ailments. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at a couple of experts a bit more de delving into Dr. Elaine Aaron's thoughts and Dr. Ted Zeff is another one. Yeah, he took on from her work and, uh, and did, uh, he's a clinical psychologist and author of the book, uh, The Highly Sensitive Persons. I've got it here. Where is it? It's here. It's a guide, isn't it? Uh, the Highly Sensitive Person's Survival Guide. Great read. Really good read. And actually, I think that, um, Elaine Co authored it with him. I know she did the foreword. Yeah. He's, um, he's, hey, look, he's got, I think he's got a few books. He's got a great website and stuff. Yeah, he has. So There's, we're going to give you all these resources. So much web content yeah. out there on this. But so today, look, we, we will rehash a little bit. Um, just if any of you are joining us who've never heard, I think, I forget what episode it was. If you go back to our back archives. Within the first it 20, was, I think, somewhere early. in there. It was an earlier one. Yeah. So look, well, Jane, can you just give, again, just a little bit of background on Dr. Elaine, and I'm going to go a little bit more into what she found, but she, what was she doing prior to the 90s? Do you remember? No idea. No, a, a it's, not, it's not actually irrelevant to the story. Different lines of research that she eventually stumbled across is where she herself she was, HSP. She was doing her, uh, she is HSP, she was doing her um, thesis yeah. for her doctorate, and her professor had said to her that he believed that there may be a trait known as sensitivity, a trait of people that are sensitive, and would she be interested in doing a PhD on that? And she said yes. Now, as a result, what she discovered is that 
It's in every single species. It's not just in the humans. It's in every creature that's ever been known to exist. It is in 18 to 20 percent. For ease, we're going to just say 20 percent of the population. And that uh, what happens with the, I guess the symptoms are many and varied, but it is that you are sensitive to life. So some people will be sensitive to chemicals, of course. Some will be sensitive to noise, light, stimulation, uh, music, uh, scratchy labels on your clothing, fabrics, food, all sorts of different things. Um, it's also that we're normally very, very sensitive to emotions and our feelings get hurt very easily. So it's the child that grows up that's being told they're a crybaby, that does cry really easily, that doesn't want to cry, that can't hold the tears in, that is told to toughen up, take a bucket of cement, to stop taking things so personally. But when the question is asked of how, nobody could answer it until now, but we're going to be answering that today. Yeah. But the thing that's important for people to understand on a, a medical level or on a science level is that we actually, and I say we because this is me, is that we have a different nervous system. Now, what happens is that we take in more sensory information than the other 80%. And I want to also say right now that if you're not a highly sensitive person, it doesn't mean that you're not a sensitive, beautiful, kind, compassionate person. What it's saying is, is that you don't have this particular trait, which comes with some great gifts and it comes with some huge challenges. So it's not to offend those that don't fall into that 20%. Now, the, the nervous system takes in more information than the 80%. So when you walk into a room, for example, a non-HSP is going to walk in and go, oh, this is great. I love that song. Oh, there's a food, a buffet food over there. I'm going over to get some food. A HSP person walks in and instantly notices that, wow, the room's pretty hot. That music's loud. Oh, those people over there look like they're about to have a fight. I'm going to stay away from them. They're the loud party people over there and, oh, lots of food going on. And, gee, I can smell a million different senses. And they're overwhelmed because they take in more information within exactly the same time. So that's what's going on with your nervous system. And the thing that the science has made so clear through Dr. Elaine's work, and she it says here she, as well, she's trained at the Jung Institute, which I think is a very interesting fact. Most back HSPs there. are richly spiritual yes. and into philosophy, and yes. yeah. Is, you know, I think some of the message she's trying to help people understand who, who perhaps aren't HSP is this is not a choice. No, it's you're not, born with it. It is a choice. genetic it's, it's like, way know, that you are born. You've got a sensitive mm -hmm. central nervous system. And yeah, that kind of bombardment Jane's talking about, because another word that, sh that it's also known by, by the name sensory processing sensitivity. Yes. Um, because they do, they tend to process more information, they process it more deeply. And the problem is it makes them more easily overwhelmed, overstimulated and stressed out. And of course, when you become overstimulated, what happens is that cortisol floods your brain. And when cortisol floods your brain, it depletes the serotonin. And the serotonin, if you think of serotonin as like, and I'm not a doctor, so apologies to those of you with much greater medical wisdom than I have. However, my layman's description is if you think of it as a little train track that's going around your brain and it's each little train carriage has all of your thought processes and memories and emotions going on, when the cortisol comes in, it actually pushes every single one of those train, tra train carriages off the track and all of those memories spill out and they're forgotten, they're lost. So many HSPs find themselves in an overwhelmed sensory state actually can't articulate themselves because the, the cortisol has depleted the serotonin. And not just that, it depletes the memory of it. So when they are asked to articulate later on the memory of being overwhelmed, all they can tell you is how they felt. They may be able to tell you the trigger, but they cannot tell you what occurred from that point on. So like, let's say somebody has a big fight. They actually can't remember anything about what was said. They have no memory of the details. Just that they're really upset. Just that they're really upset. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. And because it is so deeply linked into sort of the central nervous system, the thing is that HSPs present with so many physical ailments because their body goes under so much suffering. So there's this big list of stuff like well, mind. It does, again, because of the cortisol. Yeah. That's really so damaging to the body. Anxiety, panic attacks, nightmares, insomnia, irritable bowel syndrome, migraines, and all that sort of stuff because the nervous systems respond to stimuli so much more. They're just being bombarded, I think. There's like another that. side to that coin, though. Mm -hmm. So, for example, because I am highly sensitive, I am highly sensitive to pain. So... If I, let's say, get a headache and if there was a way of measuring the pain and a non-HSP person had identical headache, I'm going to say, oh, my God, this is a nine, and they're going to go, this is a three out of ten. Right. 
because I'm so sensitive to pain. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what happened tends to happen that even though HSPs do suffer from these medical um, conditions or um, symptoms, it's often not life threatening. They're actually detecting things at a very very early stage. Does that make sense? It does. I'm actually having a whole other flood of thought here about wimpishness in our society. Yeah. And, and this is, goes back to Ooh. the bucket of cement comment, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. How, how much anything that's perceived as wimpishness or weakling type characteristics is so stomped on by our alpha society? Exactly. And yet this is the gift of, of being able to care for your body so beautifully because you're hearing the whispers. And I have to say, I'm, oh, I hope I'm not jumping around too much here, but so in my practice, when adults come to me with screwed up lives, so often it is a case that they were such highly sensitive, sweet, beautiful children, often born in the 50s or the 70s or sometime when, yeah, if, if, if that child out. had the bleeding leg and they were feeling a 9 out of 10 of pain, it would have been, oh, come on, jump yeah, up, get on with it. put a band-aid on it, it'll yeah. be fine. And, and that's that's a small example. But then there was a lot of, obviously, an emotional shutdown and you no know, allowing for feelings and parents who didn't hug and didn't express, etc. So you've got these highly sensitive souls who've had to grow up in these really cold world environments. And these are the adults who struggle. These are the adults who are perhaps at home and antisocial. These are the adults who have the health conditions because they're suffering physically already. They put all that sad emotion that's never had an outlet. You know, they're emotionally repressed. Perhaps they've got intimacy blocks. All of this comes out when the highly sensitive person is shut down. And we've got to think here, this is 20%. What's our population One in Australia? Five people, right? What is the population in Australia? Is it 25 million or 20 something? 20 something million. Well, let's say 25 million for, for, um, Easy mass, except it's not easy mass. Let's go 20 million for easy mass. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is 4 million people in Australia have yeah. this. Now, let's talk the US. What have they got? 200 million? 360. Oh, have they? Up to 360. They have nearly 100 million people have this trait in America yeah. that do not know about this. Yeah. In schools, the, the, you know, the gardener, the person over your fence, the everyone you're it's dealing everywhere. with. Everywhere. It's everyone. It's everywhere. And it's been so suppressed. In Western society. Yeah. Now, if you were born in China, you'd be revered. Sensitivity is seen as an amazing gift. So it just depends where your culture Maybe is. Maybe not in North Korea. I mean, I, I don't know. Do you know, it's funny because, oh, I've got to be careful when we talk about cultures because it's No, we'd, no. Yeah. It's just like, don't I'm just go going, there, don't go there. there. But, okay, I'm going to just put it really generally. It's interesting how in some cultures where beautiful sensitivity, arts, culture, and those higher artistic graces are revered often they can be just as militant in the other aspect as well there can be a lot of that sort of exactly yes and yes. rigidity that, yes. that backlashes with the same it's interesting you can hold yeah. the two opposing truths in the same in the in same, same culture same breath yes, yeah exactly right. beautiful exactly yeah so where to where do you want to go from here okay. there's so much to talk about well, on this topic dr ted's f so he followed on from dr elena he, he took her yes. teachings yes she, she hasn't retired though but has he, no, no, no. he's just basically taken it and run with it even no, deeper even yeah more. he has yes he's taken it further. He's, he's kind of gone more she, she's very much in the the science behind it and he's gone more into the the functionality behind it to give a really dreadful generalization um but look both of them have really active um, newsletters um, and they do do newsletters they don't do things like uh, podcasts or videos because highly sensitive people struggle with that stuff usually so um so to- dr ted he's a clinical psychologist and the book that i came across is different from the one jane's got here but the one i found is the highly sensitive person's survival guide which is awesome because oh, actually, i think i've got that as well jane's probably got it at home it's full of coping mechanisms no that's it the highly sensitive. Oh, it is too. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. the one you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Okay. So the whole book is basically put into different categories, but you can actually find this online as well. A lot of his information is available if you just Google it and you'll find a lot of the same. So he will talk about how to calm the senses. And yep. daily routine, it seems to be the biggest thing that any HSP person needs to implement yes. if they haven't already. Yes, exactly. Why is that, Jane? Exactly. Um, I don't know why it is. This is more about, um, coping so but i think it's important for people to understand that highly sensitive people are different within that group as well there's differences so we're saying that these are the traits these are the challenges but not every person is going to experience all of these challenges right. for example i actually quite like spontaneity but that's not typical but i'm high sensation seeking yeah so in some of this i don't have this issue so i can't talk for myself because I, 
I'm in that 3%. Yeah. Not the, yeah, not the 17%. But for many, it is routine is really important. It's predictability. It's calming the senses that when something out of the ordinary appears, they really do struggle with it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So what, rather than going into why it is, I think it's probably more beneficial that we go into if you have this challenge, here's some tips to yeah. be able to cope with it. So routine's super important. And it usually is about, you know, making sure that you're, um, that when you get up in the morning, you know, we talk about this all the time, set your intent for the day. Yes. Take your time to do that. Um, you know, wake up. 15 minutes before you actually have to get out of bed and just allow yourself the gentleness of the day to enfold upon you. Yes. Um, do things like begin the day with gentle stretches. So I actually, without even real, a lot of this stuff you might find you're doing naturally and you're going, oh, that's interesting. I already do that and it does make me feel good. Yes. So for example, I get out of bed and I just go into downward dog, but I do a few different little stretches. It's not a massive exercise thing. I just do, you know, it could be 60 seconds. But I find that works. Um, really, it, look, if you can, and we've talked about this many times before, but meditation is important. Mm -hmm. But definitely quiet time is super important that you've got that scheduled. So most days I have quiet time. I actually try for an hour where I don't want anything or anyone around me. Yeah. Sometimes I'll, I'll – and if I have to have people around me, I'll go – like if I'm at home, I will check out and go and have an afternoon siesta yeah. because that's my way of – having my alone time, my energy, my aura has nobody in it, no thought process, no, no stimulation I of any it's, sort. That's, it's about listening to your little inner voice there and honouring yourself. Like there might be time. Like the other week I was out at a nightclub and it was, I just got to that point in the night where I thought, I've had enough. And it's being adult enough and, and you know, taking care of yourself enough to then say, guys, I'm done and extricate yourself from the situation and go home. And you know what, friends, like, oh, stay or this or we're just going to do that or let me get you a drink. And I've no. got a tip around that. What's I've got tip? a little tip. Is that so? Let's say you're out at a nightclub. Now it's probably what typical to head home about. I don't know. Let's say midnight, but they want to keep going until three in the morning. Nothing between midnight and three in the morning is going to happen that hasn't already happened that evening. That's hilarious. Isn't that classic? You are not going to miss out. I promise you. If you go home at twelve, <laughs> you're not going to miss out on anything because there is nothing exciting happens between twelve and three a.m. <laughs> Correct. Funny. That's quite funny. I think that's true. I think, you know, but, you know, time is important for HSPs. You know, yes. they don't want to be late. That really stresses them out. Mm. So make sure that you really do leave in plenty of time before you've got to go to your work or your own appointment or wherever it is that you have to be. But I'm saying that these protective nurturing behaviours, it's the adult in you that needs to implement them for the sweeter, softer child, perhaps, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah. There's, there's a highly sensitive little person inside you who needs a lot of taking care of. Yes. And it's up to your adult self to make sure that they are shepherded or chaperoned or buffered or all of those things that you require. Not so that you're ducking out of life or not experiencing life, but just so that you're maintaining healthy boundaries for functioning. Exactly. Exactly. So other little tools for routines are you'll probably find already that you actually have a regular bedtime and have that quiet time before you go to bed. You know, don't have the TV blaring or playing, you know, I don't know, computer games or whatever. You will also find that you probably don't watch um, violent movies, mm. that they really attack your senses. Um, I also don't tend to watch super sad movies because this is why we went on. I went on such a spiel in the last podcast about this. Like, don't watch the news. Don't watch anything that's yeah. Negative, I don't watch the news. Violent, sensationalist, upsetting stuff that you wish you'd unseen or unheard the minute you've heard it, and you can't do anything about it. And then it just plays in your head for three days. Minimize the amount of time you're staring at a computer screen, a phone screen, a television screen. Just reduce the chatter and the static. Yes. I also find that walks, gentle walks, not power walks, but heel toe slow meditative walks that you're observing nature. You might be walking through, looking at different people's gardens and the plants and architecture of different homes, etc. But just a gentle walk, um, you know, every day is a really good thing. And whether you do it first thing in the morning, last thing at night, most HSPs get tired very easily. And so um, you'll probably find that you're a morning person, so mm. get your stuff done then and give yourself permission to do nothing at night. That's yeah. okay. Be kind to yourself. And with the nature, I mean, maybe you just need a few minutes to 
calm, take some deep breaths and look out the window. Maybe you need to put some beautiful images up of natural scenes around your desk. So Gorgeous. You lose yourself in a beautiful picture or something yes. like that if you just need to ground for an instant. Yeah, yeah. Look, it kind of leads also, we've been touching on with the routine, it kind of is blurring in a bit with the senses. But basically, you want to make sure that all of your senses are constantly being calmed and nurtured and loved. So, you know, it's things like, for example, my beautiful husband of nearly 20 years has this habit of clapping his hands just once a really loud clap. What for? I don't know. I think it's like kind of a tribal thing to like clear the energy. <laughs> okay. You know, now if you were ready for it, you'd go, yeah, that's great. That's just resonated right through the home and cleared out some energy. But the three of us, because ta- both of my girls are both highly sensitive, we go through the roof, through the roof when he claps. Isn't he it's mad? like, yes. <laughs> I have torn shreds off him from doing that and no he hasn't it's just no i know oh but you know but you you know you avoid the loud noises they will really like you know if you just somebody drops a saucepan near you you're gonna go through the roof what about fingernails down a blackboard oh and teachers used to do that in the 60s and 70s Zeph says you know what maybe you need to take earplugs with you sometimes and you actually need to dull the noise out yes yes i haven't had to do that having spent so much time in nightclubs but (laughs) but i do get it yeah Yeah. absolutely and massage is really good for hsp it's really really good and I encourage that on a regular basis so if you're looking for an excuse to include a massage in your budget household Mm. budget every week there you go I've just given you permission that you now need it yeah but look it's not a desire it's a need I get a 20 minute (laughs) neck and shoulders in Chinatown every week that's something I do on the the end of my shopping and that's just a dollar a minute 20 20 dollars isn't it doesn't have to be a big expensive 120 dollars a week like full body massage yeah if you can why not yeah Um, but even the smallest bit counts makes a difference no it's funny with food too something that I want to add on there is um and I never realized this until I was looking through the books before doing this podcast, but one of um, uh, Ted's suggestions is to eat warm food. Apparently, HSPs like warm food. And I stopped and I thought, that's about all I do eat. Right. That's probably 90% is warm, not hot and not cold. No, but I'm seeing a correlation there with the Ayurvedic body types, the dosha, oh, pitta, right. kapha. So if you know anything about that, everyone's got a different type of system, again, that some people need to be cooled down, some people need to be fired up, some people need to be calmed. And so I'm a vata, which is no surprise to anyone because it is basically like the profile of an HSP. Well, it's like nervous energy, talk fast, walk fast, think fast, drive fast, do everything fast, and, I, and I'm always cold and I'm skinny and I burn everything quickly because I'm metabolizing it, I just worry my food off. Like I'm, I'm lucky in that way, but I'm very high strung. So I need root vegetables, so things that, are, that ground me like your sweet potatoes, your pumpkins, right. your, you know, carrot that orange warm nurturing thick bakes of things roasts and things like ah. that and so i imagine that there's a correlation there with the same sorts of grounding and right. calming and warming foods right sometimes like chai tea for example because it's got all those beautiful delicious spices in it like the warming spices might also help to sort of ground you and um the water mm. is also very good for hsps loads of it what is good what is good for everybody everybody, everybody. everybody. and look loads of the, everything that we're saying here is actually good for everybody I went but particularly to a, for HSPs. I went to a raw food conference recently and, you know, every hour they'd have you stand up and, you know, clap and sing and jump around to move the energy and we had to say the mantra, drink lots of water till you get clear wee. Drink lots of water till you get clear wee. <laughs> that, that is going to stay in my head for the rest of my life. But people, drink lots of water till you get clear urine. That's how you know. You're on the right track. <laughs> I was just wondering if the term we is international or not, so I'm pleased you said urine. Urine. But to that end, what about the use of caffeine and stuff with HSPs? Okay, look, um, any I find personally that any stimulant I have a, a big reaction to. Mm. So, for example, years ago when I did used to have Western medicine, I would say take, I don't know, what is it, like 15 mils of, say, a cough mixture, and I remember, <coughs> why am I coughing now? Is that like psychosomatic? I'm sure it is. Here um, it comes. So apologies for the cough. Yeah, I'm going back. I'm, I've just cellularly gone back. There you go. Yeah. It's a, a sensitive thing. Gone cough back to the memory. There it so is. I had a cough and I remember I was at work and I went out at lunchtime and got, I think it was about 19 or 20, and I bought some cough mixture. I hadn't had cough mixture for years. And took 15 mils of it and, oh, my God, it was like I was I was off my face, which means a slang term for I was highly drugged, highly drugged. I could not function with any equipment. Fast or slow. Driving fast, super fast. I felt like I was on speed. Speed, yeah. 
and I've never drunk coffee to this day. Now, I love my wine, so I'm, I'm, I'm not being a purist here, but I've just never been drawn to it. I actually mm. don't like the taste of it, and I think that the stimulant would be hard going. Um, but, yeah, so I just find that highly sensitive people are sensitive often also to, you know, alcohol and uh, all those sorts of things. And I actually, in my, you know, naughty teenage years, stayed away from drugs as well. I think I once, I, th- I know I once tried um, marijuana and it made me so paranoid. It was not funny. So really drugs and HSPs usually don't go hand in hand. No. Um, so, and, it's, and even if you were to say that you're using a stimulant drug for spiritual purposes to really want to cleanse and clear and connect with a higher source, which, you know, plenty of wonderful Indigenous tribes do responsibly mm. use these products or these um, plants. Um, as a HSP, you'd have to be very, very careful nevertheless. So even if you were using it for a great intent, right, you'd have to be very careful. And I know that, you know, the couple of times that I have had to go to hospital in my past, I've had to really be careful about with talking to anaesthetists about what are you giving me and, mm. you know, can we do the lowest dose because I tend to react what well, about even if herbal, uh, well, you know, like green tea's got a bit of caffeine. Even even subtle ones, I guess, could send people off if they're very sensitive. Yeah, I, I find that um, I can only have a little bit, yes. and I'll notice a difference. And what about sugar? Ah, oh, I'm the wrong one to ask because I've got an addiction to it. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 when I say I've got an addiction, I don't go and buy things that I believe are sugar, but I know that I like things that have sugar in them. Mm, okay, you know, so it's not like I'm sitting there eating a bag of lollies or yeah. I don't know, sugary donuts or whatever. Mm. Um, but I, look, I think that a lot of HSPs have addiction issues. Um, Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, because they're very much, whether it's conscious or subconsciously, in the moment of trying to control the moment yeah. rather than the longer term. For what? Vision. Gain. Or benefit. Peace. Just to try and control. Try and achieve peace. Yeah, peace okay. in the moment. Um, I feel. Yeah. Um, now I think, uh, Ted has some tips for, for the body, doesn't he? What does he say? Let's have a look here. What's he got? He's got, um, oh, exercise. Exercise with a buddy to create a support system. Exercise close to your home or workplace. Um, see, most, not all, but a lot of HSPs I know don't actually really organically like exercise. Yeah. That they're more into. It's almost a bit too violent for their it body. It is, it is too violent, And so yes. maybe it's, it's your walking, swimming, stretching. Yoga, yeah. um, Pilates, uh, Tai Chi. Mm. Um, all the energy yeah, All ones. of the energy ones are great. absolutely beautiful. Um, swimming is gorgeous, but not, I mean, again, you'll find it won't be doing butterfly or backstroke. It would be doing like a breaststroke, mm-hmm. gentle stroke. More with a um, yeah, water, aqua aerobics that are more gentle um, or deep water. Yeah. Uh, you'll also find but things that are a bit more fun, like belly dancing. It's oh, yeah. flowing. Yes. It's not jarring. Yes. Um, or hiking through nature. So getting your heart rate up naturally while yes. looking at beautiful scenery, fresh yes. air. Yes. And yes. And, and, and like so, yeah, parents. you you won't generally find a lot of HSPs in a gym, you know, on a treadmill, pumping weights, mm. um, doing full-blown aerobics class. Having said that, though, having been an ex-choreographer and had hundreds of professional dancers, many of them are highly sensitive. Definitely. Um, so, but I think that the set, because the sensitivity is also a creative gene, and we'll get on to the positives afterwards. Mm. Mm. Sleep. Essential oils and incense. <laughs> It's massive. Now, most HSPs need more sleep than non-HSPs. Yep. And that was something, again, in my marriage that I had to really get Simon to understand was that I'm not weak. I'm not trying to um, not pull my load, you mm-hmm. know, not do my Duck fair out. share, yep. all of that. This is how it is, that if I don't have my sleep, mm. that is the first thing to make me the crabbiest most horrible bitch mm. um, and I will become really foul. I find it really hard to control myself if I'm sleep deprived. Some people, some people are like that when they get a bit hungry too, you know, when, they, when you start yes. lacking something. Marky. Yes, yeah. yes. And to that end, I, you know, I just think, well, look, whether you're HSP or not, I think having your bedroom as the kind of place that the minute you walk through that door, you know you're in a sanctuary. That means yes. no mobile phone in there next to your head. I cannot believe that everyone in our society does not think twice about using their phone as their alarm and putting it next to their head. You want to sleep with radiation next to your dreams all night long, pinging through your brain. I can't handle it. No phones in the bedroom, no computers in the bedroom. My girlfriend just had a great big 
kind of like standoff, you know, moment with her long term relationship boyfriend about finally convincing him to get the television taken out of their bedroom. Oh, right. And she said it has made so much difference. And she said the other night I lay in his arms and we have these really deep soulful conversations and talked to a level of honesty we haven't for ages because it opens up dialogue. It opens up time for self-reflection. It opens up meditation. You know, make sure that your your sheets, your coverlets are, are soft, supportive. Make sure the lighting isn't harsh. We want soft lights or candles in, in the room. We want the room to smell good, you know, the essential oils, burn, have an oil burner. Um, I just think if there's one place in your life that you know that every time you walk through that door that you're in a in a interference free zone from the outside world, I just think you you've got to have. I think any person needs to have that to not go crazy in, in the world we live in these days. To be honest, yeah, I agree. You do need that lovely haven. Um, you really do want to go to bed before ten pm. Now, that sounds early, but that really is what most HSPs will want to do. And you do want to avoid exercising late in the afternoon or evenings. It really is a morning time for your system to be operating at its best. Yeah. So what do you want to do? You want to tackle relationships? Tell us about being an HSP in a relationship, Jane. Oh, my <laughs> I for you when you were God. <laughs> um. People can be harsh, right? Yeah, they can. Look, my feelings just got hurt every minute of every day, basically, until I started working on self-development and then found this research and, you know, and so on it went. Relationships were a huge challenge, which is why it's no great secret that that's why I do a Love Life podcast. It's why I'm a relationships coach. It's why I have social aid where I help people to have great social lives. Because what we most need to learn is what we uh, what we do. What didn't you understand back then that you wish somebody had told you? Oh, so many answers to that question. Give all right. all. The first one that comes to mind is I wish I knew that the 80% of people that are not HSPs, I wish I knew that they actually generally really were not meaning to hurt me because I couldn't understand. Right. Deeply... I could not understand how somebody could say what they say because I could do. never say that yeah. or do what they do and I could never do that to another. So it was actually, as a young person, I assumed everybody had my level of compassion. I actually thought that's what humanity is. I thought everybody had the same thing. But, Jane, you were the girl that used to pick fights when you went to every party, so how's that fact? That was later down the line. Was it? Yeah. That was the defense mechanism. Kicking you. Yeah. Later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're talking... Teenage, Teenage years. years. Okay. Yeah, mm. yeah. The other thing I wish I knew was that I wish I knew about being a HSP. I wish I knew that it was a trait. I wish I knew it was an amazing gift. And I really, we are not ending this podcast until we get onto the gifts yeah. because I want to balance the scales. Um, I wish I knew that, that it was something to be embraced and nurtured and loved and excited by, you know, and used oh, my God, this tool is not, this gift has not been used in our society anywhere near enough. And I'm really excited that before I die, I'm going to be making sure that HR people really know how to employ HSP people. Oh, and how HR to employs HSP, right. I'm with human you. resources. <laughs> right, right. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, human resource companies really understand this trait because in certain roles, these people are the rock stars in certain roles yeah. you get the right hsp in the right job and oh my god it's going to be dynamite interesting yeah so you know that's a, that's a little uh, goal for the future so relationships now what about like for example if you're an hsp and you've got to go to work under a really hard ass boss yes i mean what does one do in life you know, these are, you see the HSP ends up in the toilet crying all, all the time because mm -hmm. they kind of can't cope or can't handle. But it, what happens in the real world? How do you get by a career? Like, okay. Well, you, you know, first off, all of these tools that we've been giving of how to manage your senses, many people have not been able, have not known that, have not known how to manage their senses. So mm -hmm. if you manage them, what you're dealing is kind of turning the dial down a bit so you're not as sensitive and, um, do the work on self-love, self-belief, boundaries, um, build your resilience mm -hmm. and boundaries, which we've got plenty of podcasts to help with all of that. Because once you have those things in place, the bully boss doesn't actually matter. I can come up against any bully now and I'm cool okay. as long as I'm managing myself. But if I've had no sleep, if I've eaten the wrong food, if I've 
whatever, you know, I've frazzled my senses and then in comes the bully, it's going to be a disaster. I think I, can, I don't think we can underline this point enough. I think this is fascinating, is that you don't have to be the kind of the victim, helpless, crying agent no. for your whole life. No, You can God, master no. it and be very, very powerful in it. Well, I, I feel I have mastered this. Mm. I mean, I know there's – I'm not saying that to be conceited. There's plenty of areas in my life I'm working on. But this one, I feel I very much have mastered. Because you finally understand it for what it is and you've had enough practice out there in the yes. real world, as you would say, gathering ev- evidence. When you when you come up against people that aren't HSP and, and understanding the differences in how we behave. Yes. It's like a Mars Venus thing. Yes. <laughs> Refer to the podcast, How to Speak Your Truth, because it's also my responsibility to teach other people how to treat me. And that was a big part of being a HSP. This is the Four Agreements book, isn't it? Is, is that part of that? No. Speak uh, that's, your truth? No. Oh, yes. Yeah, speak your truth is, yes. Be impeccable with your word. Your word, yeah. Uh, simply do your best. Don't take things personally and don't make assumptions. That's well, the four agreements. Great objectives for any HSP. Yes, it is. Absolutely. That book was fabulous in helping me. Um, the mine is more about how I, how other people treat me. I have to educate them on that. I have to educate my husband. It's not okay to clap your hands. I have to educate that people are best speaking to me. In the sandwich method, I can take any criticism, but it has to be spoken kindly. I will call them on it if I feel that there's some sort of passive aggressive thing going on or some hidden agenda. I'm going to call them on it. And I'm going to say, you know, for example, I reminded Beck the other day that I'm a HSP. She did. <laughs> she did. Beck had a power moment. <laughs> She had a big power moment. I had my corporate hat on and I wrote an email the way I used to write them five years ago and Jane wrote back, darling, that's all fine, but can you just, just, can you just remember that I'm actually an HSP person, you just can't speak to me like that. And that's all it takes. And you know, I wasn't too offended. Oh, Did that offend laugh you? When I rang you up straight away, I was like, "Oh, Jane, you just caught me in a very funny moment." Yeah, but, but it didn't offend you for me no. to did it for me to say. Well, it, was a, it was a lesson. I had a gift out of that because I stopped and looked at my own behaviour and went, "Ah, oh, that was insightful for me." Okay, very insightful, very insightful. And, I was and gonna- so, but that's an example. That's an example of just saying, you know what? It's all okay. Everything is fine. However. This is how I need to be treated. Yeah. Now, this isn't, this is so rare for Beck and I to, that, that, that's enough, if there was nothing in it at no, all, no. no sting or anything in it. However, if I were to use a different example of somebody else, it would be, it is not negotiable. Um, and it would be that this is how I am to be treated. Now, I remember having a conversation with, uh, with a girl many, many years ago once I understood all this and I actually explained to her when she was upsetting me, I was actually able to sit in neutral energy and say, look, this is how I am. This is my story. This is how I find that I can continue relationships best. I know that I am more work and I fully understand if you don't want to, you know, tiptoe around the edges or, or, or because that was my just, question. What do you do if somebody says, well, why should I change who I am just for you? Why should I change the way things are, you know? That's right. And and I was okay with that. I had to become okay with that. Mm. I had to decide that people respected my sensitivity or they cannot be in my life. Now, that was a big thing. Now, I was about uh, 40 when I decided that. So that was 11 years ago and it was massive. So don't underestimate if you have to go through this, how hard it is. But what do you do with the fact that your husband still claps and doesn't, what what do you do with that? Oh, no, (laughs) he's so beautiful about, sometimes the poor guy, I actually feel for him, like (laughs) three highly sensitive women in his house. Oh my God. You know, even the cat's female, we've got hens. I'm sure the fish is female as well. Um, And I'm sure they're all highly sensitive. Um, the poor thing. I actually, no, I more have compassion for him that he is tiptoeing around a lot of emotion and sensitivity in our house. So it's, it's, he's great at it. He's fantastic. Um, I don't know what you do if you're actually married to somebody that's not towing the line that we'll have to deal with that on another episode. Well, personal but power, a friend, boundaries and demanding what you want to need. Yeah. Well, with the friends, I actually let some friends go. Now, did I let them go hostile, angry? No, no, not at all. It just couldn't be. That's mm-hmm. all. It was just that as I learnt how I was to be in a relationship, that relationship couldn't continue. Not so I just let it go. And there were a few that were so beautiful and, and really honoured and were so gorgeous that they went so far the other way about now, Jane, if it's okay, I wouldn't mind sitting down and talking. And, uh, you know, that was so gentle and tiptoeing that I said, no, I'm a bit tougher than that. 
but that was really kind. They really, they really did show consideration, which was lovely. And the education process spreads and continues. It does. And you know what's there? Actually, I tell you what's amazing. The number of times I've started the conversation, like for example, recently one of my daughters, uh, one of her teachers was having a conversation with me about how to get the best out of her in a particular field that she's showing excellence in and they wanted to really finesse it. And I went into the HSP story. Well, this is her. This is what she is. And he went really silent. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, am I on my soapbox too much or have I given you too much information? He said, no, you're just describing my brother and I. And he was having a big moment. And wow. he, and then he started asking all these other questions that were nothing to do with my child. And was that's he, really common. Was yeah, he he's actually, HSP. And he just this is really out. common. I have this happen all the time and it's quite beautiful because it sets people free and it sets, not just a set you free, from, from a chain or a restriction that's been placed upon you. But once you understand the gifts, oh my God, life's grand. So if you are not HSP, but your lover, your family, your brother, your whatever is, or your girlfriend or whoever it is in your life, what tips do you have, Jane, for people to try and better understand how to work with these people? Okay. Work with HSP. Look, understand that sometimes when they do become overwhelmed, try to just actually calm them rather than keep going with the conversation because they actually lose all ability to communicate and things will turn ugly very quickly in whatever way that is, whether it's somebody breaking down in tears or the voice gets raised or or ultimatums are thrown out, you know, cruel words are spoken. Before it gets to any of that, just calm them down and just say, it doesn't matter, it's all okay, we'll talk about it another time. And you want them to be really, well, if it was, say, one of my children, um, I would actually encourage them to remove themselves from all of us and go to their room. Okay. And, you know, I've got my little pink area. Jane's got a dedicated yeah, room. I have got a room that's dedicated to that, but it's not used anymore. My girls are older and now they go in their girl caves yeah. and their bedrooms. Um, and that's fine. So um, allow people when they become overwhelmed, and that's the biggest challenge that people have when dealing with HSPs, is when they become overwhelmed, just let them retreat in peace and go off and be private. Just let them get over it. And that's all you need to do. You don't need to do anything else. The next step, though, is that while people are mastering this, there's going to be a sense of embarrassment. So they go away, they calm down, the cortisol depletes, the serotonin resumes, life comes back to normal. So they need that time for that neurological um, processing to happen. Um, they then come back to normal, but there's a deep sense of shame and embarrassment because they can't control this while they're learning about it. Now, I can reasonably control this. I can control this 99% of the time. I can't tell you when I had a last episode of overwhelming because I know the warning signs and I know what to do and I get myself out of a situation and go. Nobody's even aware that I'm feeling overwhelmed. Wow. Nobody. Give, so us, I, give us a recent example. Oh, okay. So uh, I was at dinner with some people, a big, big group of people, and there's a couple who's um, they've separated, but they were together at this dinner, and they're both acting like sixteen year olds. Now, as a highly sensitive person and an empath, I'm taking in all their energy, and as the night wore on, the behaviour got worse, and I couldn't be around it. It was making me physically feel sick. I wanted to vomit, and at the same time, I was tired. I wanted to go home, and I was ready to have a real crack at them. And so what did I do? I just removed myself and I could feel myself start to get knacky. My body changed in posture. Yep. Um, and it was like the fight or flight. Now, if I, I had a choice, do I fight or do I fly? Flight. It's the word, you know, when you flee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the same fight or yeah, flight, yeah, isn't it? Yes. Right. So what did I do? I flee. Is I flee. And in the past you used to fight? I'd fight because I felt that I didn't know how to exit graciously okay. from a situation. So now I know how to do that really you, easily. Does that mean slipping out without telling anyone? Or does it no, mean I had no problems at saying, you um, know what, guys, I'm so tired. I'm going to head off now. Yeah. Had an awesome night and I end it beautiful, graciously. This is my boundaries. This is how I'm treating myself and no discussion will be entered into. Beautiful. You know? I love it. They're not going to get me hanging around until 3 a.m. It's not happening. Anything else um, non-HSPs should know? Or Oh, so much. Actually, Dr. Elaine Aaron wrote a book called, do you want to have a look on one of her books there and see if it's written... Now, that's the first one. That's the highly sensitive person. That's the book I encourage people to read if they want to know more about the science. She also wrote The Highly Sensitive Child, but she wrote the book The Highly Sensitive Person in Love. Oh, okay. Now, what happened, I believe, was she got married 
to a non-HSP. So that book is about what she's researched as a result. Then she gave birth to a child, and guess what? Her child was sensitive okay. because it is genetically, um, it's hereditary. Right. And it is 100% hereditary. There's no other way to get it. Okay. So this is where people, so if you are HSP, you can look to your parents and you might struggle to find it because it's been conditioned out of them. This is amazing. So for example, for me, my it's mother amazing. is a HSP and my grandmother is a HSP okay. and I could see that. But I had to, but with my mum, it was easy to see. With my dad, oh, sorry, with my grandma, much harder. Uh, she's no longer with us. She's crossed over. Um, but... um you will see, like I can spot it in my children's friends and then I look at the parents and I can spot it. Like you can, once you can spot it, it's actually really cool because here's the cruel, cruel, here's the cool thing about it is that HSPs when they're operating from their higher selves, not when they're operating from shadow side, when they're operating from their higher self are really cool friends for other HSPs. Yeah. You're safe. You're not going to hurt each other's feelings. You're really not. Mm -hmm. And, and if you do, you'll be devastated and gutted and you will do everything to workshop that out, to solve it yeah. richly and deeply, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so with children, if mm -hmm. you're, if you find yourself a non HSP parent of a highly sensitive child and you're just bewildered because you're thinking, are they overreacting? Why are they crying all the time? What am I supposed to do with this child? What do they need from me? Okay. The first thing they need is love, love and more love. All right, they need compassion and understanding. And actually, when they're crying and they're overwhelmed, that all they want to do is be held and told it's okay. That's all. You don't actually have to fix anything. You've just got to understand that the cortisol's in the brain and that they, that's what's happening, that they've had the overreaction through the nervous system of the different senses being overwhelmed, and then the cortisol's come in and they are not coping, and that's just in the moment. So all you need to do is cuddle them. That's it. Just cuddle them. And don't force them out of it. Just let them be, let them get over it. Usually after an episode, I'll call it an episode, you will be incredibly tired. <laughs> and it's like take yourself to bed and go to sleep. Right. Incredibly tired. Um, it's possibly like how somebody might feel if they had an epileptic seizure. Yeah. I don't know. I've never had that. But I'm imagining that real exhaustion through the body. Because why? What's Is it that you're soaking up your child? No, I think it's the it's cortisol that causes it. I'd have to look. I don't know what causes it. Are but you saying the children are the ones that need to go and have the sleep after? No, yeah, the person that's HSP. It is, so the child okay. or whoever's had an episode, an episode of being overwhelmed. Yeah, okay. Right? But the other thing I want people to know is that shy does not exist. This is important. Shy does not exist. Yeah. I'm so firm on this. Okay. So everybody that says, oh, my little one's so shy, and, you know, I can remember – when my children were, you know, at kindergarten and at, um, at primary school, you know, starting off at reception and year one and, and their friends, mothers would, you know, come to the birthday party and they'd say, Oh, do you mind if I stay? She's very shy. And I go, no, that's fine. She's not shy. She's highly sensitive. She's walked into a room and she's got a bloody lot going on in her nervous system right now. Right. And if anything, they're actually the reverse. Because they're actually taking in so much. Right. Does that make sense? I'm thinking everyone I know that's shy, yeah. adult and child, yeah. and they're it's not fascinating. They're not. When now they, look, there would be some people who would have the quality of being shy in given situations because of social programming and fear. Okay, so you would have that where I'm shy because the world hurts me. Yeah. But the chances are they're shy because the world hurts them because they're HSP. Yeah, I understand. Yeah? If they're hiding in your skirts or behind your legs and all that sort of thing. Yeah. You're trying to block it out. Yeah, exactly. So if you're parenting, if you're a non-HSP and you're parenting a HSP child, the signs are that they cry easily, that their feelings get hurt, that they're very sensitive, as we've said, to all the other things such as clothes and um, hot water or anything. All of those things. Cold. All of those yeah. things need to be really calmed right down. Um, and, you know, scratchy, particularly like scratchy um, labels on mm. clothes and fabrics, you know, they'll have certain things that they. It's my son. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm seeing. I'm joining some dots here. Okay. And uh, so you just need to allow them to feel. Allow them to feel. Please don't shame them. You know, I, I would never describe, well, my children aren't shy because it's just not being, pro it's yeah. not, 
occurred because I managed their sensitivity from a really young age. Yes. They weren't forced into situations that they weren't ready to walk into. Right. Yeah. So you have to just allow them to not feel any shame in this, that this is all normal mm-hmm. and it's beautiful. But I also absolutely insist that you buy Dr. Elaine Aaron's book, The Highly Sensitive Child. And the subtitle there is Helping Our Children th- Thrive When the World Overwhelms Them. Beautiful. So let's talk about the gifts to finish off this hour. What have you found to be the gifts, the richest parts of this experience? I can have the deepest relationships with anybody in the entire world, deeper than I believe anybody else. Wow. And what does that mean? That's so cool. What does deep mean? On a soul connection. I can make people feel so safe to have, to be authentic. Authenticity. Okay. I know somebody, I know who they are, I know their beautiful, authentic self, and I love that. And they open up, they feel those vibes, and they open right up with true vulnerability. Exactly. It's beautiful, and And, I love that. And then true healing work can take place as well, right? Well, exactly, but even if it's not about wanting to help another to heal, Mm. it's that as as a relationship progresses and is built on vulnerability, I'm free to be me, Mm. too. Right. I'm safe to be me. Double You know? (laughs) The next gift, or these aren't really in any order, but that this what's coming to mind, I guess, is an order. Creativity. Mm-hmm. I have to be creative every day, or I feel like I shrivel up and die. I, I and I love it, and I. It's so easy to be creative, whether it's pick up a paintbrush and do something traditionally creative, or whether it's problem solving creative, or whether it's visionary creative. I love it. I thrive on it. That's Tony Day just though. It's 100% of HSPs are creative. It is the creative gene. Yeah, Dr. Elaine Aaron discovered that it is the creative gene. Which means you are going to have certain fields, maybe like say music or dance or drama or art or writers or whatever, who are all pretty much going to be HSPs. And then you have other fields like, I don't know, what about who are going to be? Let's imagine. A HSP politician. Well, that's what I'm I Amazing. Am actually trying to pick Amazing. That. Bob Brown? I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, look, some of the most amazing leaders in the world are, are well known. Yeah, he's known as HSP. She lists all these people. Okay. Um, Princess Diana, yeah, HSP. She, uh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Um, uh, Oprah. Um, Deepak no. Chopra. Oh, yeah, she is. Yeah, yeah. HSP. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that she... Yeah, why wouldn't she be? I'm more curious to know why you would think she's not. Because, because she's had, she's lived so many decades in an environment where she has to be such a bully and so thick skinned to win the battles against the suits. She's a HSS though. Okay. High sensation right. seeking and HSP. an extroverted HSP. That's right. So she fits the same criteria. And then the I'll H- just put myself in the same bracket as Oprah. Yes. Hello. Why not? Oh, that's a bit cheeky. <laughs> but that, no, but that's where the HSP is, where she's able to conduct the interviews and bring out the authenticity yes. that you're talking about. The deep soul yes. connecting yes. works for that capacity. Yes. But she would have had to learn some coping. Yeah. Well, you got the fight or flight, and what did I used to do? I used to fight. Mm, okay. And now what I do is I don't fight. I speak my truth with my firm boundaries in place and teach people how I'm treated. Right. Or get on your bike and get out my way. And it's that simple. That sounds harsh, but you yeah. know what? There you go. HSP giving a harsh art statement. If you don't treat me the way that I desire to be treated, you can F off. Yeah. How's that There's for tough? Passion coming out of Jane here. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, I did that deliberately to energetically show mm. what a HSS, HSP does. Yes. So Oprah's one. Deepak Chopra, all of our greatest spiritual leaders, yeah. every one of these wonderful people, Wayne Dyer, all these incredible people that you adore, Dream virtue, you know, yeah. following their their work, these are all HSPs. Mm. If you get into your artists, your Leonardo da Vinci's, etc. if you get into your greatest poets and um, musicians, you know, your Mozarts, your Beethovens, you can get into your modern day ones like um, Bono. Um, you know, there's incredible musicians yeah. that are HSPs. Um there's so many, it's not funny. Your actors, the best actors in the world will be HSPs. No doubt. Now, yeah. I just, so I'm doing the gift thing, but I also want to go, but if you're not a HSP, it doesn't mean that you can't be the world's best musician, painter, dancer, actor, um, humanitarian, um, visionary, spiritual writer. It doesn't matter. You can be. But if you've got this gift, you've got it. If you are a HSP, you have the creative gene. There is no HSP on this planet that doesn't have it. Yeah. So use it. Yes. Yes. Use it. Use your gifts. Any other gifts you want to mention, Joe? I think they're the two biggest ones for me. Yeah. 
But I think there is also, of course, which does come with the, you know, I said about the rich relationship building, but I also want to touch on humanity, compassion, empathy, kindness. So you don't have to be aiming to be on the grand stage and be the best at something. With this gift, this is the gift that is the mum that's going to the kindy with all of the children and there's the little child that's being a little bit bullied and he's having a little tear in a corner and nobody wants to know that little boy because he's been a pain in the ass. And the highly sensitive mum comes over and just grabs his hand and walks with him on the school excursion. Yeah. That is using your creativity. That's using your, uh, sorry, not creative. That's using your empathy, your sensitivity, your compassion, your kindness. You actually also have the gift of, uh, which everybody does, however, 100% of HSPs will find it much easier to connect with spirit. Mm -hmm. So however you choose to do that, whether, you know, that is um, in any of your mediumship, clairvoyance sort of abilities, you can start to really develop those. Natural intuition. Yes, or whether Mm -hmm. you choose to use it in in a way of life um, or whether it's that for most HSPs, spirituality is actually essential for happiness. It's another so way to calm the senses. I it imagine. is, that's right. Yeah. To believe in something greater than yourself, to be able to connect with something that is greater than yourself. Mm. And you'll find that you can hear very easily. You can hear the words of the universe very, very easily mm. from a higher the intelligence. The breathing of the planet, Mother yeah. Earth. Yeah. Every breath. And so the HSPs will be the people that will also be the volunteers at the homeless shelters, at the animal rescue shelters, at the... Um, uh, they may not be chaining themselves unless they're a HSS, HSP, to, to a tree to save a forest, but they'll be making the cups of coffee for the people that are chained to the... And I was wondering that, are they the nurses, the teachers, the healers, the yes, helpers? The, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm. There's so many beautiful, important roles. And as you can imagine, you know, the teachers, the nurses, the doctors, the politicians, imagine more HSP gifts being projected into these roles, the compassion, the empathy, the kindness, the loyalty, the cleverness. But the other reason, why is this in every species? Why? Because it's the intuitive sixth sense that says, don't press that red button that's going to drop the nuclear bomb. <sighs> I see something that you don't see. Fascinating. So it's the it's in every tribe. It's the animals that are about to go running through a forest and there's that one that's got the, or the 20% that have got the sense that mm. says, actually, don't do that. There's an alligator in there that's going to come and eat you all up. We're not going there. Mm. So that's why it's in every species. It's the survival of yes. the species. Now, if every creature on this planet has 20% that have HSP to ensure their survival, why the hell are we not using the 20% of HSPs on this planet of humans to ensure the survival of our species? Well, Jane. Jane for president. <laughs> <laughs> that, it's quite mind-blowing, really. And it's a lot I've to spent the whole in. time in Parliament saying, no, I'm sorry, you're not going to speak to me like that. <laughs> you would. You would. I can picture it now, honestly. Um I really love what we've been able to do with this episode because I feel it did go very deep and rich. And and thank you for sharing so much personal I've actually stuff. Got tears in my oh, the HSP's crying, so the non HSP's now going to have to carve down and exit the situation and make a cup of caramel tea. And I'll so I'll just I'll end off the episode, but Jane will say her final affirmation. I embrace my sensitivity as the amazing gift it is. <laughs> and we embrace all of your gifts too. Go out in the world and share them. Go out, recognize them, own them, honor them within yourself. And really give yourself permission to step into this, to this identity if this is who you are. And despite all the naysayers you've heard your whole life, now's the time to reclaim back these gifts and really, really, really use that purpose that you've come down to life with. Find the best creative expressions for you, the best, the ways that best align with your soul to, to get these gifts out there, to be who you are and to share with others. So thank you so much for joining us today on Love life. I nearly said the wellness couch, but we're there too. You'll find us on thewellnesscouch.com. You'll find us on <laughs> iTunes. You'll find us on Facebook. We are all around the place. You'll find us individually. If you have all kinds of things going on in your personal life that you want really, really deep coaching, counseling, intuitive guidance on, you'll find Jane on Jane Donovan. Uh, JaneDonovan.com.au. And I'm on RebeccaDetman.com. And I will apologize for these tears, but actually here is the example. 
there's the example of even a HSS, HSP that's used to doing stage stuff and speaking and all of that. At the end of it, I've just done a trip down memory lane and what's happened, up comes all the past and there's the tears. Yes. <laughs> and this is, so it's real, right? So it's we're, very real. We're not scared to cry in front of you and no, you shouldn't be scared to cry in front of no, us. Let's all have no. a cry together. Beautiful. So until this time next week, stay sensitive, stay connected, stay good and kind and gentle to yourself and have a beautiful week. Life is perfect, I'm not trying, it's just happening, and it's a beautiful day.